por favor. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you could join us for coming from the other panel. We still have a couple of people coming in, but uh, we're going to start uh, anyway, as I briefly introduce why we are here in this panel, what can we expect to see. I am Carlos Lever. I am the Dean of Social Sciences in, in Mexico City for the School of Social Sciences and Government of Tech de Monterrey. And it is my pleasure to be a part of this very interesting conference with our National Statistic Agency in Mexico, INEGI, uh, where we are exploring new data and methods for generating official data. As a brief intro to this uh, panel, let me just mention that if we had had this, uh, we've been talking for several months about organizing this uh, type of conference and, and it's really part of a dialogue of many years where we're in a long-term trend of understanding how we can use this abundance of data that's being generated now to improve our understanding of official statistics and how the economy works. But this would have been a very staid and long-term matter where we try to find the right balance between the abundance of information we have and the challenges we face when we try to make decisions based on data that were not designed to be representative of the problems we're trying to face. And then something changed, of course. We're in the middle of a pandemic, our whole lifetimes are changed, and we have a new sense of urgency uh, that with the big challenges that we face in the pandemic, we reach to hand up this big promise of things that, that people like our excellent panelists have been working on for several years. And let me just put a brief example, and I can't help but mention a, a government topic, one theme of the election yesterday, which uh, the election two days ago, which we are still waiting to see the results, is that the electorate in the United States split between a difference of opinion between those that thought that dealing with the, um, the health issues of, of the pandemic were more relevant and tended to vote for Biden, and those that thought that it was more relevant to start the economy going, and people who declared that they thought that, that it was more important to get the economy going tended to vote for Trump in a very divided election. Now, we need more information. We have this promise of trying to do these new data sets because this question is a false dilemma. We have ample evidence to know that even in places where the government is trying to tell people go and do your economic activities and ignore the pandemic, it's simply not true that you can expect people to resume life as normal and we have a very substantial drop in economic uh, activity. On the other hand, uh, it is also true or it seems to be that we're getting an understanding that we have these fat tail phenomena where a few events are responsible for most of the contagions of pandemic, which just begs the question if we really have to have a generalized lockdown. But we will not be able to have a more sensible answer if we do not have the data to be able to analyze it. And in that sense, this panel is excellently placed to teach us some lessons. This is freshly um, uh, work. They, uh, they've been working a few months. We're going to have the panel on consumer mobility and expenditure during COVID-19 using French transaction data. And let me just briefly introduce our panelists before uh, ceding the, um, the floor to them. Of course, we want to listen to them more. We also want to have a dialogue here. So if at any point you want to have any questions, please add them to the chat in this Zoom meeting. I will try to condense them after the presentation of our panelists. Starting with our panelists, we have Professor Galbraith, who is an, an econometrician from the Department of Economics at McGill University, where he has been at since 1987. He has made excellent contribution in our understanding of time series uh, forecasts, macroeconomics and financial inclusion. So uh, John has taught us a lot about this, this uh, how do we learn from these data where we don't have the luxury of designing the ideal data set. We have to learn from the data set we have. And more recently, John has been interested in these new data sets, how can we improve them for traditional uh, forecasting and macroeconomic uh, questions. Also with us, we have uh, his co-author, David Bonny, who is at Telecom Paris, uh, Institut Polytechnique. He is the head of the economics and social science there. David is interested in the digital economy and especially with applications to financial inclusion, with of course have uh, very important questions to ask of how the digital technologies are gonna change both in developed and developing countries, the access to the financial system. And finally, the third co-author will also be joining us. Youssef Kamer is a PhD candidate in economics and data science at uh, Telecom Paris, and he's very interested in using these massive data sets of bank transactions to improve uh, macroeconomic and financial forecasts, both using old techniques and using new techniques from machine learning. So we have a lot to learn, uh, a lot of promise of relevant questions to be asked. 
So with that, I see the floor. Professor Galbraith, it's a pleasure to have us with us. Uh, the floor is all yours. Okay, yeah, gracias uh, por la invitación. Um, I will um, share my screen as soon as I can get that to work. Um, I have to admit someone to get the button to show. There we go. And I hope you can see my slides now. Is that okay? Great, thank you. Okay, well, thank you again very much, Carlos, for that introduction. You've already introduced my co-authors, David Bouni and Yusuf Kamara. I want to thank also um, the providers of the data, um, which uh, we've been working with, provided uh, to David uh, in his uh, chair in digital finance, as you pointed out. It's the Groupement des Cartes Bancaires, CB, in France. And they provided very detailed data to us, which we will uh, be describing. It's very nice to have followed um, Antonio's excellent presentation earlier today because he's already made a number of points about the nature of different data types that we'll be working with. And I'll be able to contrast uh, and compare what we're working with relative to what he has been using. So I'm going to indicate um, there are a number of research questions that I want to give uh, an overview of today. Rather than presenting one thing in tremendous detail, given the time, I'd like to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we are trying to do and that we think we're able to learn with these data, because I think there are many interesting things that can come out and many interesting research questions. So I'll try to give a bit of an overview. Um, so the trade-off will be, I'll be a little bit superficial perhaps rather than deep in each of these questions, but I hope uh, it will um, uh, stimulate interest among people. So I'll just give a very quick overview of some relevant dates. I'll talk about these data just quickly, uh, again, in contrast with the um, kind of data, well, and comparison that Antonio uh, was working with. And then I'll try to do two things. One, give an overview of monitoring of the economy, the degree to which we are able to do it with these data. So this will be a descriptive part of my talk in a sense, which will be to some extent analogous to Antonio's uh, presentation. And then I'll move into more model-based results where there are things that we can learn. Well, we can also learn about some of this mobility in particular uh, as a descriptive matter. And I'll present some distribution or density functions to describe some of these things. But we'll also move into some uh, model-based results to indicate impact effects of um, the pandemic. But we'll be able to look at things like the degree to which consumers can substitute online and offline to reduce the impact of some of the shock of the pandemic. And we see some indications also of consumer learning about online activity, which may have long-term effects. We see some implications for different sectors of the economy, and we see some implications for uh, regional economic activity as well. So I'll try to make some points about some things that we are researching on these questions that we think are interesting. So here are some general research questions. Um, how did the pandemic and the containment, we're speaking now of France, roughly in the first uh, five months of this year, how did this affect consumers' movements? Because we have individual transaction data, we can track people moving through France as they make purchases. We're going to look at the differential effects of the containment across different consumer sectors and what that tells us about consumer behavior, about the effects of the lockdown. Again, a point that Carlos was making earlier about tracking effects of the containment. We're going to look at the way in which consumers might be able to mitigate the effects of the containment through moving toward online expenditures, which also has implications for the distinction between debit and credit cards, um, which uh, I've come to realize is, is important. And in some of the earlier data sets that I've worked with, I had only debit card data, and it's becoming clear that the balance between those will shift during shocks. And finally, again, we'll ask what effects we can observe on interregional trade. So I'll try to give an overview of some of the things that we think we can learn about each of these things. So just very quickly, the relevant dates are the middle of March to um, the middle of June. Um, in which the lockdown was uh, imposed and then progressively loosened in France. So until about the middle of March, 
um, things were roughly proceeding as normal. And then we're going to look at the effects of the shock. So in the monitoring part of this talk, I'll describe those dates. And in the model-based part of the talk, I look at an indicator for being in that period and we'll trace the effects of some of these things through that time. So these are dates that are similar to the effects in every country in the world. So the data that we're working with are very interesting, I think. And um, uh, as I say, David is the, the uh, expert on this and he has been working with this organization for some time. It really covers a very, very broad range of financial institutions in France, 100 um, financial institutions. There are about 70 um, uh, million cards in use and um, uh, over a million affiliated merchants. There are about 10 billion transactions per year, which we can see. So in 2019 and 2020, we have about 20 billion individual transactions to work with. So although for some purposes, we would aggregate these to a daily level, for other purposes, we will work with the individual transactions. And in particular, if we observe, for example, that a person makes a transaction, let's say in Paris, and that the person's next transaction at a point of sale is in another city, say Marseille in the south, we know that the person has moved between these cities if it's an in-person transaction. So that will be useful to us. We have the precise geographical location at which a transaction takes place. So that lies behind our information on mobility and allows us to track individuals. So for this paper, we're working with about 5 billion transactions during that relevant time period in 2019 and 2020. So um, the first thing we're going to do, as I say, is just do a little tracking of um, what happened to individual consumption through this period. So again, to contrast with um, Antonio's work described earlier today, Antonio is looking at a number of interesting indicators to try to find, perhaps I'm summarizing too much, but from my present point of view, what's relevant is he's looking at a number of different indicators to try to obtain correlates of overall economic activity of GDP, as he was saying. And uh, so electricity, heavy vehicle traffic, all of these things are relevant because they can provide indicators of global economic activity. Here we are restricting ourselves to dealing with individual consumption activity. So it's about 60% of most economies. Um, but uh, although we are restricting ourselves to that part, so Antonio also had card transaction data, we are working just with those. Although we are restricting ourselves just to the consumption data, we, because we are working with the individual transactions, there are a number of interesting bits of detail that I think we can see in these things. So we're going to begin with the tracking. We'll look at aggregate daily consumption. We can also look at intraday dynamics. We can see the entire 24 hour period and how the patterns of expenditure within the 24 hour period were changing in France during the pandemic. Some of these things are a little bit hard to, uh, we can speculate about the reasons why we can observe them but to understand why is I think a little challenging in some cases. We can also look at weekly dynamics and how that has changed again during the pandemic period. So I'm going to show a few pictures now and just make some 2019, 2020 comparisons and make some comparisons of the January through mid-March period before the containment. And then the mid-March through mid-June period when the most intense restrictions were in place in France. Following that time, uh, the lockdown eased. Of course, just in the last few weeks, France has gone into a heavier lockdown again, but this is not in the data set for the present paper. So here, just on the level of monitoring uh, consumption activity in the economy, here we are in uh, the period from January through um, the middle of um, June, I think, the end of this graph. I guess we're not quite to the end of June, we're into May. Um, so what we see, first of all, is that in the pre-containment period, 2019 and 2020 are very similar. All of the indicators that we observe throughout this tend to indicate the same thing. Before the containment, the change between 2019 and 2020 is very small. They're just minor bits of evolution. Once the containment hits, of course, we see dramatic effects. So in comparing these two graphs, I'm gonna minimize the pictures of us all for a moment. 
we see that the volume of transactions over here decreased relative to the previous year even more than did the value. That is a pattern we'll see again. Consumers were making fewer transactions, but of larger value on average. They were making fewer trips to stores. Here are the patterns within the day. So this is the 24 hour clock uh, beginning at midnight to just before midnight, comparing the two years in the period before the containment, very little change. Consumption activity picks up, peaks around 11 a.m. It's a little bit lower at lunch. This may reflect to some extent uh, French traditions, um, possibly also um, in most European countries, perhaps less so in North America, in, sorry, in, you know, the northern countries of North America, let me say. Um, uh, again, it picks up in the afternoon and falls off during the day. Once we compare um, the uh, containment period, so 2020 is now the red period, we see that there's quite a change in daily dynamics. The afternoon peak in consumption falls much more than the morning peak in consumption. So I say we can think about why that might be true, but I don't have a complete explanation of it. We can, however, track this in the data uh, quite clearly. Within the week, again, comparing 2019 and 2020 before the containment, there is virtually no difference in the weekly patterns. Sunday shows much lower activity. Saturday is the peak of activity. We see the uh, mid after the lunchtime, sorry, let me say reduction in activity clearly in all of these days except Sunday where there's a regular dropping off. And again, within the week in 2020, we see the lower activity. We see the later afternoon peak much lower now than the morning peak. And this lunchtime reduction is uh, much smaller. So we can track this activity at quite high frequency, that is to say hourly throughout the day and throughout the week with these data. Now, one of the things that I think is most interesting about this is um, the uh, mobility information that we're able to get from the data. So um, these transactions, as I say, have individual timestamps and they have precise geographic locations so that we can observe consumers moving throughout France. We can observe um, an indicator of the number of um, kilometers that they move throughout the year, again, when they are making transactions. Um, and another thing that we do is that we impute a home location for the card. So we, rather than looking at a legal address, we look at the place where most transactions are made. We consider that to be the individual's home. And then we observe um, purchases that are made outside the home. So we're observing a kind of individual level trade that takes place either through travel or through online purchases where people make these purchases elsewhere. So we can look at the distribution of distances traveled, number of cities visited, and the value of expenditure outside the home region. And again, we'll compare in each of these pictures the period 2019, 2020, before the pandemic dates, January, February, first part of March, and then the pandemic containment period. Again, as Carlos was saying earlier, you know, comparing directly the effects of the shock of this containment, try to observe what they are. So uh, again, before the shock period, 2019, 2020, uh, this is the uh, something like a density function of distances traveled. When we look at the containment period, so 2020 is the red line, the density is shifted towards much shorter distances traveled. And people who traveled longer distances out here in, the, in this region of the graph, 400, 600, 800 kilometers uh, between um, transactions, the number of people out here is greatly reduced. So we're seeing the impact of the containment, people genuinely were restricting their movements outside the home region. Number of cities visited, again, 2019 and 2020 are virtually identical in the period before the containment. No discernible difference to your eye. Once the containment goes into place, the density shifts greatly towards being in only one city or a very small number of cities. And very, very few people visited as many as six cities. In the, in the period in the previous year, um, March, April, May, 
many people visited a much larger number of cities. So the density was much higher in this region. So again, we're seeing direct observation of the reduction in consumer mobility and a measure of the effect of the containment on consumers and of the effectiveness of the policy. Uh, proportion of consumption expenditures outside the home city. Again, very similar 2019, 2020 before the shock period. In the April, May period uh, before in, in 2019, um, a large proportion of people made uh, relatively large uh, proportions of their purchases outside the home city. In 2020, uh, a large, the largest proportion of people um, made no purchases outside the home city. Zero here is the peak value. And again, the distribution has shifted towards very low values. Number of retailers visited, same story. It's greatly reduced. So this is um, uh, descriptive and it's tracking the effects of the shock on individual behavior. And we're seeing the extent to which these containment restrictions in a sense were respected by the population and had effects on the population. And through these effects, we are observing economic effects as well. So the reduction in interregional expenditures, which we'll see in just a few minutes. So now we'll pass to some model-based results. These are essentially descriptive, as I say, tracking what we can through direct observation of the data, uh, tracking what we can about consumers' movements and their expenditures. And we can observe a lot of detail thanks to the richness of this data set. So now we're going to look at some, as I say, some more model-based results to try to deduce some things about economic behavior, about how consumers adapted to the shock and reduced the effect of the shock um, on themselves. So online point of sale substitution is a critical element in that. Differences across economic sectors are meaningful and the regional effects. So we're going to use the difference in different specification. The critical, since time is short, I'll just circle this variable here. Um, I believe you can see my, um, my cursor, I hope so. Uh, so I'm just circling beta post and to be the indicator variable for the effect of being in the post um, containment period. So this period from mid-March through mid-June when France was in a heavy lockdown and we're looking at what the effects are differentially across online, offline and different sectors of the economy, which we think is interesting. So uh, to check validity, we have to see that the containment values are pretty similar. That's essentially what we saw in these graphics, that the pre-containment pre 2019 and 2020 are very similar. We'll see that here in the numerical estimates as well. So that's beta pre in these graphs. So just quickly, some numbers, I don't wanna to show too many, but beta pre uh, for value, volume and value per transaction, very small numbers for the pre-pandemic differences online, Pretty small numbers. Some effects are in the ballpark of significance, but pretty small numbers. For the containment period, let's look at value since time is short. Um, value alone, a huge reduction in the value of consumer transactions uh, during the containment period. So this is the numerical counterpart of some of the first graphics that I put up. By the way, I see there are questions in the chat and I'll certainly try to answer those uh, later assuming that uh, los preguntas uh, in inglés, <laughs> por favor. Um, uh, but I will go through those later on unless Carlos wants to do that and summarize them. Um, the uh, online effects of the containment, much smaller. Uh, the effects are present, uh, but much smaller. And we're going to see later how that evolved through time. I think that's very, very interesting. So here are the point of sale expenditures. Um, we see this very rapid drop. Here we are smoothing these. We have quite high frequency data available, but I think the easiest thing to see is the smoothing of the expenditures um, that gives us the overall picture. Um, and uh, we see that the point of sale expenditures dropped rapidly and they stayed, although they recovered a bit, they stayed pretty low throughout this period. When we look at the online expenditures, we see again, they dropped rapidly. It's mainly the red line, the value that I am um, uh, interested in because that is the counterpart of the consumption number that appears in national accounts, that appears in gross domestic product. It fell and then it recovered almost to pre-pandemic levels. And as we go out a bit here, it actually 
um, it, it came right back up to where it was and uh, exceeded at some points where it was before. So online expenditure recovered more rapidly and got right back to where it was before. And we suspect there may be permanent effects of this, that there is consumer learning. But the several results will, I think, help us to understand this later. Um, so let's look at those sectoral results. France divided, the government of France divided um, sectors into essential and non-essential. And the non-essential stores were essentially closed. Whereas in the essential sectors, stores could stay open. So we expect to see differences. And we think that in interpreting those differences, we can, um, we can learn something. So uh, the data give us a precise code for the type of consumer expenditure, and that allows us to, uh, I think, observe some very interesting things. So here are some uh, sectors that were deemed to be essential. So this is France, so patisserie, that's considered an essential service. Uh, we want to get a pain au chocolat, and, and the government did not want to close those down. So I think that's the right way to live. Um, so uh, grocery stores actually showed increases in expenditures, point of sale and online, because of course, restaurants were closing. So people were shifting as in, I think, virtually every country that I'm aware of, um, because restaurants were closing or only moving to takeout, uh, grocery store expenditures actually increased, bakery expenditures decreased, um, and pharmacies were roughly flat. But in each of these things, we see an increase in online expenditures. So consumers were moving toward online. And in the detailed data where we track this daily or weekly, we see the shift through time. And I think I can show you a few indicators of that in just a moment. Now for the non-essential sectors, clothing, footwear, and so on, where the government closed the actual physical stores, we see these dramatic declines. I mean, essentially all purchases stopped in store for clothing and footwear. So if it had not been for the availability of online shopping, uh, people would not have been able to buy any clothing or footwear at all, but they were doing so. They made large movements in the direction of the online shopping channel. And again, in more detailed data that we don't have time for, you can see the evolution of this through the pandemic period, through the containment, I believe we can see consumer learning, which may have long-term effects. Um, and we see that people, there is also, I have no time today, but there are also interesting distinctions between durable and non-durable goods. Um, so durable goods purchases appear to have been recouped later. They, they slowed down for a while, but people are making those purchases later. So we see a clear distinction between um, the essential and non-essential sectors. We see that the stores and consumers were respecting the containment restrictions almost completely with respect to uh, these non-essential sectors such as clothing and footwear. And we see that substitution toward online allowed them to reduce the effects of the containment period. So just quickly, because I know I'm, I'm nearly out of time, although I haven't got that on my screen anymore, I'm sorry. Uh, Carlos, please cut me off if I, if I go on too long or uh, somebody, please cut me off, whoever is in charge at this point. So just quickly, the interregional effects. I think this is very interesting because I, I think that all I of think our we have a, John, we have about uh, three to five minutes more. And, perfect. And I'll, I'll Thank you. you. That's, Thank you, that's perfect. I, I think in all of our countries, we're going to start experiencing inter-regional effects as consumers move toward online shopping because uh, online shopping may be more concentrated in certain regions. So that in France, for example, we believe that because a lot of the large online retailers have their um, big depots, their big storage uh, entrepot, uh, we say in French, uh, their, their entrepot, their big storage places from which they ship in the outskirts of Paris, a lot of this activity is taking place in the outskirts of Paris, which might otherwise have been in store. So we're just looking at purchases made by people in one administrative region of France, but made in another administrative region. And we're looking at how they changed over the pandemic period. Thank you for the questions I see coming in and I will try to get to them when, when someone tells me it's okay. So uh, what do we observe? Um, Inter-regional expenditures. I go to another region of France. Let's say I live in Marseille and I go to um, Bretagne and I, I make a purchase. 
in April, it's almost completely stopped. It's essentially a 100% reduction, very dramatic reductions throughout this, in, this entire period. But the online expenditures, which were initially reduced between regions, started to increase. And again, we see that effect more substantially in other results. So globally, there's not much time for this, but um, these interregional point of sale purchases require that the consumer was individually present and they were very severely curtailed, almost stopped. Again, the French were clearly respecting these containment restrictions very, very completely. Online expenditures started to increase and allowed people to reduce some of the impact of the shock. So I believe that the availability of this online shopping option allowed people to allow the economy to be more robust to this shock. The effect of the shock was reduced because of this alternative channel. And I think that may be a fairly general phenomenon. And I think again, that there's consumer learning. So just global summary, these detailed transaction data are available, first of all, in real time monitoring as Antonio was arguing very successfully this morning, using a broader set of indicators as well. But with the detailed individual transaction, they are data, they're also valuable in studying aspects of consumer behavior and the evolution of the economy, the evolution of interregional trade, the evolution of online versus offline, uh, the evolution of credit versus debit in now casting, because online tends to be debit, uh, it tends to be credit. And so we need to look at the credit, particularly to capture the online shopping channel. So finally, just to end, and I hope consistent with the time, just quick answers to the research questions that I indicated at the beginning of this talk. So how did the pandemic affect consumers' movements? It was very effective in reducing consumer movements. They were very sharply curtailed. A few people were still moving around, but it was very sharply curtailed by any measure, by number of cities, by distance traveled, by number of retailers outside the home city, all of these measures very much reduced. What were the different effects across different consumer sectors and what do they reveal about the effects of the pandemic and, and the containment? Well, the effects differ greatly by sector. The essential sectors show a smaller point of sale effects and even positive ones in some cases, whereas for non-essential sectors, point of sale expenditures almost dried up in some cases. And that again suggests that the containment restrictions were very effective, very well respected, but this is also one of the mechanisms by which economic activity was reduced. To what extent could consumers mitigate the effects of the containment um, and um, uh, move to online purchases, but just make the economy more robust? Well, there is evidence that they did so and that they are learning and that that learning uh, about online purchasing, that increasing familiarity of the individual with online purchasing uh, was accelerating as the containment continued and may have long lasting effects. Finally, what effects do we observe on inter-regional retail trade? Point of sale purchases by consumers declined dramatically and online out of uh, region purchases actually began to increase. And again, we're seeing consumer adaptation and mitigation of the shocks. So um, that is um, what I want to say to give this quick overview of these research areas. Uh, I hope there's some element in there um, that you find interesting. And um, after today's talk, I'll certainly be uh, very interested to hear uh, from anyone who is working with data um, either in Mexico or elsewhere. Perhaps I should say Mexico. I do know how to pronounce it, but anyway. Um, I'll be interested to hear from anyone who um, is working with data of this type with any work that you're doing. I think that, um, and again, uh, um, Antonio was making this point and, and Carlos was making this point. Um, we are doing much better in our ability to follow the economy quickly and to understand uh, what is going on at a more detailed level by moving away from official data and by bringing in these new data sources. I think it's real scientific progress and I'm very, very interested to hear about work that others are doing. Um, my email address is easy to find. It's my name, john.galbraith at mcgill.ca. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Galbraith. I, I'd like to have a quick re reaction and then um, I'll try to collect the questions we've been having in the chat. Several of them are quite interesting. So, so one reaction to the presentation and um, 
this might not be obvious to everybody, but I do want to point out, uh, Professor Galbraith started with some a question that seems technical and innocent that we're going to study substitution effects. But this is, in fact, a very profound question in the sense that we've known for a long time in official statistics that our official statistics have too much inertia and that drives in on how we evaluate the welfare of consumers. Because of course, people are making decisions all the time and they're trying to advance their interests, they're trying to advance their objectives. And in the ma and, and insofar as that they're able to react and substitute between activities at a frequency that's much higher than what we do in official data where we might uh, measure expenditures in traditional methods every couple of years, well, we're simply not capturing the welfare effects of what's actually going on with consumers. And, and that we, we've known for a, for a while that it's a problem with um, inflation data. We've tried to do chain methods to try to do not a terrible job, especially with new technologies. But when you really have a crisis like this one, where we've seen drops that we had never seen, uh, Professor Graeber's social numbers of 60% drop, 30% drop, these are not normal numbers. We are breaking the numbers by far any point. So of course, especially in this kind of situation, we would be very much interested in the ability of people and commerce firms to react and substitute away and, and not necessarily want to trust that the drop, that the fact that they're not doing what they were doing before necessarily represents a drop in their welfare. So in, in that sense, uh, it's very refreshing that with this kind of data, we can start to address those questions and, and it's uh, of the mo utmost importance. Uh, I do think that we might have a blind spot, but this could be a direction for, for future uh, work in another kind of questions that um, are hard to answer with traditional data, but this data would seem to be the right data uh, to do it. And it, these are distributional questions. Usually macroeconomic data uh, tend to focus on aggregates. And of course, we want to address the aggregates. We don't want to, to quit to the previous question. But again, in a crisis like this one, there is very real reasons to be concerned that the aggregate might be masking an increase in the variance of how this is affecting different individuals, but also different commerces. And let me just put one example. Um, but Professor Garvey showed us an example that there is some substitution, not complete, some substitution between online sale and point of sale sale at the sectoral level. So we know for a fact, and if the, the big aggregates are like that, that not all the transactions that were realized at the point of sale were able to be substituted online. But the second uh, layer that we could put on this is, well, is it actually the same businesses? Um, and this is a very relevant question for governments because governments are trying to extend the benefits and the protection they give towards all businesses. So it would be uh, actually relevant to see if some of maybe the smaller businesses who are not uh, presumably don't have as much of online presence, are they able to move online? Or in fact, are these businesses no longer viable and maybe we would need going forward given the substantial sum that we're spending on, on these stimulus to really rethink how we think about that, not at the sectoral level, but at the firm level. And at some point, even at, at the individual level. And then another thing that um, uh, point that, that I would like to make that has nothing to do with the authors is it has to do with the pandemic. It is very clear that we have evidence here that the lockdown moved things in the right direction. People move less from, from their locality. They move less between cities. But what's really frustrating in the pandemic as COVID is uh, I'm not sure that we have uh, our finger at the granularity we need. How much of this drop is enough? Do we need people to move from six cities to two cities? Or do we really need an effectiveness of people being, I don't know, 90 something percent just keeping to their city if we're going to contain this disease? So there's this interesting tension where in economic terms, it's obvious that something's happening there. Mobility is moving down, it's affecting the economy, but is it enough for what this pandemic needs for this very particular type of, of virus, which is highly contagious? No, so, so it's food for thought. And, and, and I guess it's a good reflection of how we have the data, but then interpreting the data, it's hard. And, and it generally depends on, on the context we have. Um, Professor, I don't know if you have a reaction before we move to some of the questions we have in the audience. I, I, we yes, will... thank you. I... Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do want to comment because those are both very, very good points. And one of them we've thought about, one of them is tough. So um, I'll uh, take, first of all, the question about the pandemic. 
Um, I, I don't know, it, very important question. I don't know how to answer it. Um, uh, epidemiologists, I hope, could use information of this type and perhaps with some interplay, you know, experts on, you know, the, the spread of disease and what the R value is and so on, um, could use even more detailed data than is presented here. Um, perhaps to say something about this. We're also able, although I haven't done it, and you know, you're absolutely right, it's a very good point. We're also able to track movements within a city. So that we, we were looking at these administrative units within France, which is a much smaller um, administrative unit than a state in Mexico or the US or something. There are about 95, they call them départements in France, uh, departments. Um, we're looking at movements between those, but we can track movements within uh, postal regions within Paris or something. So that could be very relevant to that question. Uh, it's an excellent point, and I, I don't know the answer. Your first point um, we did think about, and that is distributional effects. And in fact, with a, we have a paper with a big team of people, including a lot of people in the UK on this. Um, uh, Here's the way we thought about it. The reason it's, or one reason why it's difficult is we don't observe, of course, the income of consumers in our sample. Um, so if we knew their individual identities and their annual incomes, we could say, okay, how are richer people affected more than others? But it's just clearly a very important question. So we tried to think about it by, among other things, looking at the proportion of expenditures that are made on necessities. Because one indicator of low income is that there is a large proportion of your expenditure that is on necessities, of course. Whereas consumers who spend a large proportion on jewelry or uh, restaurant meals, things of this type, especially expensive restaurant meals, they tend to be wealthier consumers. So we can get some signal of the wealth of consumers or of the, the income of consumers. And we, we tried to work with that to look at the differential impact across different income groups. And uh, you're right that it's, it's very interesting. It seems that in France, at least, social supports kicked in quite quickly so that the impact on low income people seems to have been um, reduced. Uh, through very, very quick action on the part of the French government. Um, and in various ways, we did try to track that, but it's very imperfect because we cannot get, of course, because of confidentiality, we can't get the identities of individuals in the data set. And so we can't observe their bank balances, for example. Um, but uh, we're still thinking about that and it's clearly a very important point. Yes, thank you for raising both of those things. The second one, it's tough. Well, uh, let me take that last comment. It's connected to one of the questions we have. Uh, Pedro uh, would like to know if you can tell us a little bit more about what sort of counter cycle policies that the French government take. You told us a little bit about the individuals, but there were also important programs, uh, I understand, at the firm level. And, and maybe it'd be useful for all of us if you could have a general reflection. How do we turn this data into action? If you're a government, you have to take some measures. Clearly, governments in the world did very different actions. So I'm trying to keep the workers at the firm, others trying to give an employment benefits. Could we use any of this data to, to reflect on how to improve these, these policy tools? Yes, well, that's obviously a critical point. Now, I am not an expert on France, I'm Canadian, and I know a little bit about what went on there. Um, uh, David Bouni would be the best person to, to answer that question, but I do know a little bit. Um, I know that income supports for individuals kicked in quickly. And um, I believe that the French government was doing um, rent support, for example, for businesses, but I, I don't know about this or when it kicked in. So I, I can't answer the specifics of your question very well. Um, however, uh, the general point that you're making is obviously the critical one. How do we use information like this to do better? And I think, the answer is that this has been one of the longest standing problems that economists have had. We, it, this goes back to Milton Friedman's old joke about the economist, you know, turning the hot water tap too late after, you know, um, whenever it heats up, you turn down the hot water tap, then it gets too cold. We're trying to react. We're trying to pursue counter cyclical policy, but our data, as people were saying in the earlier talk this morning, I guess Antonio was saying, our data are coming out uh, you know, six weeks, even eight weeks after the end of the quarter. This does not allow us to react on time. 
So whatever reaction we may choose to make, whether it's individual income support, support for rental on premises for businesses, support for payrolls for businesses, reduction in payroll taxes for businesses, whatever kind of support we might choose to give in a crisis, we need to observe as quickly as possible when something dramatic is happening. And if we are waiting for those um, uh, global economic data, such as GDP, or even monthly numbers, such as industrial production, as Antonio was saying, we are going to be delayed. And um, the approach that Antonio was taking, bringing in these other indicators, or the approach that we're taking here, focusing on uh, the welfare of individuals, but also of businesses through purchases, whichever approach we're taking, we're getting just immediate next day indications of these dramatic falls. And that means that governments can see uh, what is happening quickly. And I, I believe I, I've seen studies of this type coming out from central banks around the world. Um, uh, central banks, a lot of economists anyway, in central banks and, and uh, to some extent, I would imagine in finance departments, ministries and governments, but I've seen many studies from central banks. Uh, people were using transaction data very early in this to tracking the extent of the decline. And you can see this in monetary policy reports from many central banks. So again, I feel that this is a way in which economists are making real scientific progress. We are exploiting new data to get a clearer indication of what is going on in the economy. We have better information. We're using the information efficiently. And as a result of that, we are able to benefit society by helping governments to do the right thing more quickly rather than with a six week time lag. So I, I really feel that this is genuine progress in our subject. And the fact that it's, it's being done in many places around the world in many central banks, to me is an indication uh, of, of you know, an openness in our profession to these new data, which I think is, is very beneficial. I'm very, very happy to see it going on around the world. Thank you for those reflections. It connects well with another uh, question we have that might sound technical, but I think it's actually provocative. And it's about CPI weights for inflation measuring. And let me just add as a little context. In fact, we had a dialogue with uh, one of the deputy governors of the central bank a few months ago. And this topic came up during the crisis. We had these countervailing effects. On one hand, gasoline prices plummeted, which is good for measured inflation. And, but we did see some pressure on food prices going up. And if you just went with the regular CPI weight, you would say, well, these sort of things counteract, but, but uh, the reflection that came up at that moment uh, was, should we trust the weights we have in a moment where people are not using their cars and therefore cannot benefit from the drop of prices in gasoline, but they're definitely having to, to spend on food, especially food at home. And maybe you should uh, give some more weight than, than the methods we have currently to food prices. But here's a provocation. So the provocation comes like this. Uh, do you think your data is ready that we should make a stance methodologically and uh, in the middle of the cycle, before the next revision, which happens every year, should we change our expenditure weights to be very quick to react? Or would that open a, a, a whole sorts of other problems where this data is not ready to deal with in measured inflation? Um, how do you feel, how confident do you feel of changing this methodological question? Well, Carlos, that's a hard question and it's provocative also. So I'll do my best to, to think about it. It's obviously, it's a very important point and I, I um, have certainly not done any work on CPI weights. I'll tell you the thing that occurs to me as you're saying this, and this didn't occur to me before, but I mean, you and the questioner have brought up very important points here. What I would be inclined to do if, if, if I were responsible for this in a statistical agency, would be perhaps to have in my back pocket something that I might call a kind of um, a shock CPI, if you like, or a shock index in my back pocket. And um, I might be tracking uh, an index with weights that will be relevant in times of economic crisis. We do have economic crises from time to time. We had the crisis 10 years ago, the financial crisis, we've got another one now. These things come around from time to time. And a point you were making earlier, some people suffer more than others. And uh, we will be in these crisis times, we may be particularly concerned with the prices of goods 
that are consumed by um, relatively uh, poorly, uh, poorly off people. We may be particularly concerned with the prices of necessities. And we may have some alternative indices um, ready uh, to work with and to give to policymakers when the next crisis comes along. It, it is not necessarily something that we would need or even want to report regularly through the year because we're not in crisis most of the time, but economists could be tracking this so that when a crisis comes along, we can say, okay, it's time to pull out these numbers on our crisis weights and provide this alternative CPI to policymakers and be able to say to them, look, we've been working with this for some time. We've, we've been experimenting and it's telling us that right now we, we need to pay attention to increases, you know, here in food prices or whatever it is. It's an indicator of hardship perhaps for some groups. Uh, and, and because we've been working with it since 2020, we have some experience with it and we would already be able to hit the ground running as we say, and, and be able to provide that information to policymakers. So I think it's a great idea. I hadn't thought of it, but I think it's a great idea because it's another way in which we can use new information to make scientific progress and to provide uh, benefit to society. So if there are those of you out there who are specialists in CPI, maybe you can start doing that. Let me know if you do. <laughs> it sounds like it could be useful, but it's not something that I have um, worked on. It's a great idea, I think, to, to look at that. Well, well, there's something that I like very much in your answer, and I do want to point out. Uh, implicit in your answer is, uh, let's not act like this crisis is something that we have never seen, and therefore we cannot learn from the past. Because it's true that the, the, the level that we've seen in this crisis is something new, but the direction and, and, and the basic correlation between different data are repeating patterns that we have seen in traditional crisis. Just to cite one pattern you see, uh, it's refreshing to know that durable goods, sure they dropped at the beginning, but that's exactly the sort of consumption that you can recoup uh, it's not so much that you're, you're stopping this consumption, it's that you're postponing, uh, but there's no reason to believe that that's going to happen when, when it's non-durable good consumption. Of course, the, the road that we did not travel is, is the gasoline we are not going to use twice as intensely in the future. But again, the, the basic point is crises are infrequent, but they do happen and we do have these correlations. Let's uh, not quit to the fact that we can learn from the past. We have time for one more question, um, and this is more on the long-term trend. Uh, somebody's asking, and you mentioned this several times, about more about trend. You do seem to think you have uh, evidence of learning here, and maybe trends that are going to stick, especially moving online. How do you disentangle that? Um, uh, what sort of thing would you be looking at to say, this movement in online, the data tells me, probably is going to be more sticky going forward? Or, or what, um, what would you try to filter out as noise that's just a reaction to, to the crisis in front of us? Well, um, yeah, the way you put it is exactly right. I seem to think, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and uh, the indications that we've seen are that the online shopping was actually increasing to above its previous level and it was remaining fairly stable. I only presented today data up through about mid-May, but we have data now going farther on. So in what we have been able to see so far, that trend appears to be sticking. However, we do remain in a crisis period and particularly in France, which has been very hard hit lately. And so it's possible that all of this is purely a crisis effect. Um, and, you know, with respect to the comment you just made a minute ago, uh, of course, crises are very important. When the economy is ticking on normally, economists can kind of keep an eye on things, but we're perhaps not critical to society in the short term. But in crises, we can react and make a big contribution to, to benefiting society. And so it is particularly important that we be able to understand what's going on in those times. And uh, even if it is just mitigation of shocks during crises, that is important. We will find out about this, however, simply by continuing to monitor the online versus offline as we move out of the crisis period. And in order to do more than speculate, we will, of course, have to wait for those data to come in. But if it does turn out to be true, one thing that does concern me a little bit, and again, it's related to comments about distribution, um, it may tend to concentrate economic activity in particular regions of the country. Um, 
people tend to shop with big online retailers with a very few um, uh, big uh, stores. Um, and that may mean that uh, local shops get less business. It may mean that less populated uh, areas of the country where there aren't big storage um, facilities get less business. I don't know, but it is possible that there will be distributional effects within countries arising because of this as well. And if the online trend and if consumers are pushed by the crisis to move more in that direction, if that continues, there could be regional distributional effects. And I think we should be monitoring this. It's one of the things that we should be tracking as economists and thinking about whether we want to do anything about it, whether we don't, whether welfare is affected. Um, I don't know the answer, but with data, we can at least see what's going on. And then lots of smart people will think about these questions. A uh, great reflection. And, and, I, and I won't stop mentioning, especially in Mexico, where we're having this tourism shock and international tourism. We really want to be paying attention to these geographic mobility issues which we have reasons to believe that uh, people react, but react in so far as moving where they live, that that's something we should be less confident. Our time is up, Professor Garvey, but it's been truly a pleasure. I learned a lot in this presentation and I'm sure our audience has too. Uh, I will give you a virtual clap here. This finishes our <laughs> panel for, for today, but we're gonna have uh, continue with this very interesting uh, conference. I believe our next panel is November 12th. Thank you very much for, for your interesting work. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us this morning. Thank and, you very much. Uh, please, for the rest of the audience, keep on, on tuned in the conference. We'll be happy to receive you in, in our next sessions as the program has announced. Thank you.